So as everyone continues to trickle in, I'd like to officially welcome you to our webinar today, Investing Trends in Clean Tech and Looking Ahead to 2023. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by NECEC, the Northeast Clean Energy Council, and MINTS. Hello, I'm Trisha Dinkle, and I'm the director of the Northeast Clean Energy Council, or NECEC's Innovation Resource Network, Navigate. And it's a true pleasure to be with all of you today for today's webinar. We are very grateful for NECC's partnership with MINTS and their invaluable support for our policy work and our innovation programs, both the Clean Tech Open Northeast and NECC Navigate. MINTS also offers services, event support, and industry resources. Uh, I'm sorry, program. I'm on this uh, phone now. Yeah, how you doing? Startups. If you could just keep yourself muted, uh, we'll go through housekeeping, but muted. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to recognize NECC's innovation team for their efforts and their hard work and to introduce NECC's Vice President of Partnerships and Innovation, Alistair Pym. So to say a few words about NECC, turn it over to Alistair. Thank you, Tricia. And just before I get going, just going to wonder if we're sharing slides now or when I finish, but I'll, I'll keep going. So hi, everyone. Who Alistair to speak? Pym. Was that Tricia? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Honestly. Uh, NECC. So we're a, a nonprofit business association that is leading the just, equitable, and rapid transition to a clean energy future and a diverse climate economy. So think of us as a collection of networks and programs. We help with state level policy advocacy, also helping on regulations. <laughs> we develop new markets. And in, in the words of one of our team, we lay the green carpet for all of the businesses out there to in these new emerging businesses. And then relevant to today, we support innovators and entrepreneurs with our two innovation programs. Navigate, which Trisha leads, uh, which not only puts on webinars like these to educate uh, entrepreneurs, but also connects them to the resources they need like um, investors, corporates, and customers. And then um, Beth Zonis, I'll introduce now, is our senior director for Cleantech Open Northeast, who leads our accelerator program, and I'll let her explain everything about that. So look forward to the uh, webinar today. Beth, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair, and uh, great to see everyone here. And uh, just a very quick introduction, which is in case you are unfamiliar with Clean Tech Open, and also to reinforce if you are, that Clean Tech Open Northeast is the Northeast region of the Clean Tech Open, which is a national accelerator for early stage, pre-seed, pre-revenue, uh, clean tech startups, clean tech meaning climate tech, sustainability, a wide variety of, of solutions are eligible. It's like a mini MBA with expert mentoring, introductions to investors, lots of professional connections, and the opportunity to win cash prizes on your way to commercializing your solutions. So making a big difference and uh, improving the improving the um, the environment through innovation and entrepreneurship while we're also growing the green economy. And now I'll pass it over back to Trisha. Excellent, thanks Beth. Um, and thank you and, and very brief, um, NECC Navigate is an innovation resource network. We aim to connect early stage clean tech and climate tech startups with investors and corporates, customers and partners to accelerate the commercialization of their technology solutions. So Navigate hosts our flagship event, the Investor Corporate Customer Connect, or ICCC, twice a year to provide that connection forum for curated meetings between investors, corporates, and clean tech startups from across North America and Europe. So we're very excited for today's agenda and webinar. And with a bit of a delay, we will jump be jumping right into our program. Um, and in just a minute here, I'll be introducing our moderator for today's program, Tom Burton of Mintz. And Tom will lead us through brief panel introductions, and then we'll go straight into a panel discussion and an, um, following by an audience-led Q&A. We will then just have brief closing remarks with the real focus being on today's panel discussion and the Q&A. Just very, very quick housekeeping um, so you all can maximize your experience in the webinar. Please keep yourself muted throughout the duration of the webinar. This helps um, ensure that it's quality audio for all the other attendees so they can hear the discussion and the responses to the questions. If you do have questions, feel free to enter them at any point into the chat. We will be monitoring them on the back end and making sure that they're prepared for when we transition into the Q&A portion of today's webinar. 
Um, this webinar, as you likely noted when you logged on, but just to reinforce it, it is being recorded. And we will be circulating the recording following the webinar to all registered attendees. Um, what will make it helpful in terms of the Q&A process, if you could take a moment to rename yourself in Zoom, so it is your name with a dash and then the company that you're representing here today. Um, and with that being said, we'll hop right into it. So now it is my true pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Tom Burton of Mints. Tom is a leading advocate for innovation in energy and clean tech. He founded and has led Mince's energy and sustainability practice for over 18 years, completing 500 transactions totaling over $10 billion. Tom, I'd like to um, now have you say a few words about Mince, introduce yourself. Come on, Jim. And then you'll go on to panel introductions um, in which you'll hear from the panelists very briefly, one at a time. Um, for a little background about their perspective and what they're offering to today's discussion. So with that, welcome, Tom, to today's webinar. Thanks very much, Trish. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to the afternoon uh, and looking ahead to 2023 Investing Trends in Clean Tech. I'm going to skip a few words about Mints. Uh, Trish, I think, said all that needed to be said for the purposes of this audience, and we're going to dive right in, save ourselves a couple of minutes uh, so we can get to the substance quickly. We have a fantastic group of panelists. We're really fortunate to have uh, this group of experts uh, today. So I want to start off by uh, at least having uh, all of you learn a minute or two about them, and then we'll dive into more of the substance. So I'm going to kick things off by going to Cassie Bow and asking her to introduce herself. Cassie was with Energy Impact Partners. Hey everyone, Cassie here from EIP. Excited to talk to you today. Just a little bit about EIP. We are a three billion assets under management venture capital and private equity fund. We invest across energy transition and climate tech. So uh, excited to opine on the trends today. What makes us a little different is that a majority of our capital comes from a large network of strategic investors. So we have 65 strategic investors across our platform, utilities, energy companies, oil and gas, real estate. Um, and so between that group and our portfolio of more than 100 companies, we have a pretty unique insight into what's going on in clean tech trends and excited to talk about it today. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Rob Day with Spring Lane Capital. Hey there, thanks everybody. Nice to be here today. Um, so Spring Lane Capital, we are actually a project finance firm by orientation. Uh, we focus entirely on the sustainability sector, so energy, food, water, waste, transportation. Uh, I've been an investor in the in the sustainability sector now for getting embarrassingly close to two decades, but um, most of that was actually in growth equity. And at Spring Lane, we really operate at the intersection of growth equity and project finance in that we view our role as being uh, the providers of the first two to three years worth of deployment capital for many of the solutions that have been innovated uh, either recently or in decades past, but are ready for prime time and ready to scale. And now on to Dan Goldman with Clean Energy Ventures. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here and uh, good to see some, some faces on um, board members of NECEC. And thank you to NECEC and to Mintz for being um, such staunch supporters of our local climate ecosystem. So really um, happy that you're able to lead this webinar and, um, and play such a huge role in our ecosystem. So I'm one of the co-founders of Clean Energy Ventures. We grew out of an angel group called Clean Energy Venture Group, um, which was started by uh, Dave Miller, uh, my co-founder, and I back in 2005. So since then, we've been investing in early stage climate technologies. Um, we've invested in probably over 50 companies since 2005, and we're now operating two funds, uh, two venture capital funds, with the goal of investing in early stage technologies that can grow to scale, be financially successful, but also meet a carbon reduction metric. And, and in our case, we use two and a half gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions reduction um, from the time we invest to 2050. So a cumulative number over um, approximately 30 years. And the goal is, is really to find technologies that are so impactful um, that they can have really massive greenhouse gas emissions reduction. And of course, to do so, they need to be financially successful. So we see those as completely aligned. Mark Murano, Canaccord. 
Sure. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so Mark Morano, an investment banker with Canaccord Genuity. Um, those of you not familiar with Canaccord, we're a global firm. We have 2,500 employees, generate approximately $2 billion in revenue. We're full service. Uh, so half what we do is in the public markets. We cover public companies with research, trade their stocks. We underwrite IPOs, other equity follow-on offerings. We advise on M&A transactions, help late-stage companies raise capital among amongst the Numerous other activities. Uh, I joined the firm in 2004, uh, it's almost been 20 years like Rob, uh, focused on the sustainability sector where we've closed hundreds of, of deals in, um, in sustainability. Now on to Ethan Zindler with Bloomberg NEF. Yeah, hi folks, uh, Ethan here with Bloomberg NEF uh, based here in Washington, DC. Um, for those of you who don't know us, Bloomberg NEF is the uh, energy market research division of Bloomberg. And um, we've been around um, actually for about 16, 17 years, and I've been with the firm almost all that time. We were a startup called New Energy Finance that had a little tiny bit of venture money um, and then um, sold the company to Bloomberg at the end of 2009. Um, what we do is we write research uh, about um, the micro and macroeconomic trends in the sector. We don't do company specific stuff, um, but we write about um, everything from renewables to electric vehicles to batteries, um, and it's a subscription based service. Um, and then just a big thanks to NECEC uh, and to Mintz for hosting me. I also note that I'm, I think, the only person on the panel here who's not an investor, so um, or has, or is at least not organizing uh, other people's money to be invested. So, um, so, so they have they have the real battle scars to speak about, whereas I've just uh, been saying a lot of stuff for a long time, but not actually taking a hit or getting any real upside on this. So, uh, back to you. Well, the great news here is that we've got a broad range of panelists, right? We've we've got early, we've got late, we've got projects. You know, we've got this you know, broad overview that you're going to have, Ethan, and uh, we're we're really fortunate to have the whole group here. I'm going to kick it all off by um, actually uh, fo focusing some of our initial questions from the perspective of what is an opportunity on the investor side, and then you know how should founders be thinking about the upcoming year. So, with this first question, it's going to be really a question: What uh, do the panelists see as the emerging investing opportunities? in clean tech and how uh, might these opportunities be different than in past years so what do you see next year for investors and uh, well let's start with dan and we'll go from there okay thanks tom um yeah so i think uh we're we're in a very exciting space um and I, I think obviously what we've all witnessed over the last um you know nine to twelve months is pretty substantial changes in the in the global financial markets, both decline in in financial markets, inflation, uh, interest rates rising. Um, we have a war in Ukraine. Uh, we have supply chain issues. We have oil prices rising. So those are really fundamental changes from what we've seen over the last decade. And we've had an incredible run up and incredible amounts of money flowing into climate tech um, over this period. And so when we look forward to 2023, I think, you know, we could see some pretty rocky roads in terms of investment opportunities and um, kind of a little bit of a shakeout of uh, which companies survive and which don't. So, you know, one of the things we're definitely advising is to be cautious in how you spend money and, and, and be, um, you know, and, and you're thinking about capital raising because we think it is going to be a more challenging environment in 2023, notwithstanding all the dry powder that's uh, that's moved into the climate tech space. But I think one of the things that's emerged from the challenges, the capital market challenges, is that people are trying to fix supply chains. They're trying to you know, invest more in circular economy uh, opportunities. Um, they're trying to fix our single use plastics. Um, so there are a lot of trends that I think are emerging from what are challenges over the last uh, year or so that are leading to really, really interesting uh, climate technology opportunities for investors. And those include decarbonization of the industrial sector, um, things like heat pumps and, uh, and either ground source or air source heat pumps are, have become really interesting because of in particular your European uh, drive to defossilize their economies. So we're seeing, you know, out of um, some really challenging market environments, we're seeing a lot of opportunities emerge as well. And I think um, the Inflation Reduction Act, which I think we'll come on to talk about, only enhances that opportunity. And of course, in Europe as well, where we invest, we have Fit for 55, and, and that's another 
way in which we're seeing a lot of government support and a lot of acceleration um, of, of this investment infrastructure. Great, thanks, Dan. And Cassie, where do you see those emerging investment opportunities? Yeah, I think the IRA is, it's obviously an amazing step for our sector. And once the IRA passed, we were obviously very excited, but then we started seeing like, an, this is what IRA means for our company slide in like everyone's company's presentation from the startup side. And I so think, so I think what we're trying to do right now is sort through, okay, IRA happened. This means a lot for a lot of different sectors, but where is it going to really move the needle most? And what should that mean for us changing our investment approach? Uh, and I think it's actually more of a nuanced question than it might seem. Like obviously it's it's tailwinds for most of the sector, but we're really trying to say what where are the best opportunities from this legislation. I think we're really excited about storage. It's it's just unbelievable seeing what's going on in terms of everything from utility scale to residential storage adoption and then just batteries and everything. So we're trying to understand uh, where the opportunities are there across the value chain, everything from domestic supply chain to the end installation and battery analytics. So that's a trend we're excited about this year. Great. And how about uh, Rob Day? What's your perspective looking at it a little bit of a later stage? Sure. And obviously more of a project finance orientation as well. I Because yeah, I would echo what Dan and Cassie just said, um, smart thoughts. I would point to a couple of things in particular in addition to that. One is we're seeing a dramatic ramp up since the IRA passed um, in hydrogen in particular. Um, just because of the refundability uh, that is applicable there. Um, you know, what that means is direct payment, essentially, um, to anybody developing a project that is around hydrogen generation. And there's obviously, you know, specific details as to how much you get that we're waiting to see. But that's already launched a massive wave of activity in the hydrogen space that, you know, as a longtime investor, I frankly have been skeptical that I would ever see. Um, but, uh, you know, that having been said, it does seem to have really changed some of the dynamics there. I mean, interesting to see how that shakes up. The other thing I would point to is it's not a particular sector um, per se, uh, although I think, you know, waste of value continues to be a really exciting area uh, to be in right now, circular economy and the like. But more importantly, I think 2023, the the, the really interesting um, trend is going to be around deployment in general, just transitioning from coming up with stuff and commercializing it, which has been great, but it's time to put stuff into the world at scale. Uh, you know, I know we'll, we'll go to Ethan, and if you look at the Bloomberg NEF data um, that they track every single year, and you look at the amount of dollars that go into innovation versus into deployment, deployment obviously dwarfs. Uh, any of the scale of what goes into funding innovation. Um, but that's been predominantly in wind and solar and started to be in storage. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting year for a whole lot of other types of solutions across the energy, food, water, waste, transportation landscape, um, and being able to put actual assets out there into the world at scale that are that are operating. Rob, thank you for teeing up Ethan for his response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you just stole my notes. Um, but it, it's exactly right. So, you know, we tracked um, about $920 billion in total, um, what we call energy transition uh, investment and climate tech corporate finance. And as Rob exactly alluded to, three three quarters of a trillion or $750 billion was around the deployment of stuff. And by the way, we do count about $260 billion of EV sales in there. So, But even subtracting that out, you're talking about you know a, a solid $500 billion of deployment capital to build large-scale wind, solar, and other projects. Uh, and then that other $165 billion or so, roughly, um, was what we call climate tech investment. And that was the money that was raised um, over uh, the public markets um, and also over venture uh, VCPE uh, uh, sources as well. And last year, 20, and that's a 2021 number, just to be clear, last year was, I would argue, was pretty frothy, particularly in terms of the amount of money that was raised over the public markets, thanks to the SPAC phenomenon and the broader phenomenon of the markets being so hot. Um, we don't think we're going to see that kind of money raised over the public markets this year. That's just not uh, realistic um, or practical um, going forward. And it's sort of ironic because I could make the case that 
the signals were have been much clearer in 2022 from a policy perspective than they were in 2021 about where we were going. Um, um, so now is actually, you could argue, a much better time um, to be deploying capital into the space than 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 last year. But nonetheless, um, you know, I think there's opportunities on both sides. Uh, and to actually answer the the question, sorry, the long preamble. Um, one area I think is intriguing and is is going to be around manufacturing, uh, because of the level of subsidy uh, that the IRA uh, provides to try and build out a manufacturing uh, value chain for batteries, for solar, for other stuff um, in the United States. Frankly, from a policy perspective, whether all of it's going to work, uh, I don't know. Um, but it's intriguing that we now have the Europeans complaining that, like, the U.S. is being too nice to our manufacturers. Um, so we must be doing something right, um, obviously. And so I think one of the things that we're kind of curious about is how much actual capital gets deployed around manufacturing. Um, and then I think this sort of a question for the panelists is I don't quite know where that provides opportunities around innovation financing and venture capital. And maybe this is too far sort of downstream um, for some of that, but uh, but there probably are some opportunities there as well. Mark, uh, lastly, uh, any thoughts from your perspective and what you see on those opportunities for investors that are coming up? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd probably break it down in between sort of secular trends and macro environment. And I, I can't help but, you know, think of the quote, you know, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? I mean, from the best of times, we've been doing this for 20 years, I, we've not seen, you know, such strong secular, you know, uh, tailwinds here meaningful i mean you guys mentioned the the ira meaningful you know legislative support also states are supporting boards are supporting investors are supporting consumer uh sentiment technologies are coming online so and it really and you asked sort of the particular areas i i think it's incredibly broad based it's utilities the grid renewables ev storage hydrogen it's, it's all of it um, on the worst of times, you know, that, that probably overstates it, but I think we are, I think the consensus is 2023s, we're heading into uh, into a recession. Obviously, the capital markets, um, particularly on the public side, are, are challenging, if not uh, dead. I mean, you'll see an IPO here and there, but it really has been uh, mostly shut down. I think most people, sus you know, um, suspect that will continue continue into next year. Uh, maybe echo um, um, Dan's comments, I think, you know, uh, particularly on the on the founders and, and entrepreneur side, you know, I think they need to be uh, cognizant of that, that next year may be, you know, more challenging on the on the capital raise side. Well, that's a good point. Let's segue into challenges. I think that's a good, uh, good next thing to be talking about. You know, obviously challenges in the public markets, um, some some challenges out there, but a lot of tailwinds, a lot of capital being raised. We just saw or heard the numbers from Ethan. Um, so, you know, with this sort of uh, uh, good and uh, good good things and bad things happening at once, uh, you know, what are some of the key challenges that you know, you're seeing with your portfolio companies or that you anticipate will be you know uh, difficult to to work through in 2023? That's an open question for whoever wants to dive in. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in real quick on that. Um, as you know, Dan and, and Mark were just alluding to, you know, what we're already seeing is a tightening of the capital markets. Uh, and, and what that means specifically um, is it's getting harder and harder for companies to raise capital, uh, particularly at the kind of valuations that they've seen. Um, you know, one of the things that we're encouraging a lot of companies to do is look for non-dilutive sources of financing while they could get it. Uh, and just generally, you know, having seen a few of these cycles, I'm sure, you know, others on the panel will echo me and saying, this is the time where if there's money on the table, take it, you know, get, get your, get your, um, you know, your, your dry powder to be able to survive through the coming uh, half year, because, you know, th this truly is a time when there's going to be some uh, macroeconomic headwinds. Uh, and then we've got these sectoral tailwinds. And if you can just manage to navigate through the next half year to 12 months um, without having to sacrifice too much uh, to be able to take money in and just keep going, then you're gonna be really well positioned after that, right? Because a lot of the uh, specific incentives are gonna be um, you know, promulgated and made more specific. That's gonna unleash even more corporate and large financial interest once they actually know what the rules of the road are gonna be around transferability and refundability and all of that stuff. Um, so this is a time to batten down the hatches. Uh, don't go for broke in the first half of 2023, take money while you can get it. Um, and, and then from there, be ready to go for broke. I, 
I completely agree. And we're definitely advising companies to take money when and where they can get it right now. I think that the other challenge is operationally, it's a bit more straightforward for other sectors right now in terms of the playbook. You know, let's do some layoffs. Let's make sure we're, um, you know, we, everyone grew a lot over the past couple of years. Let's make sure we're right sizing and surviving. 2023 is going to be a really hard year. It, it's kind of more straightforward for our sector. As you said, Tom, we have the headwinds and we have the tailwinds. So it makes it a little more complicated for companies in our portfolio to understand how to navigate it because a lot of them aren't seeing the impact on the actual revenue and sales side yet. And so it's a little bit of a question of, is the other issue going to drop for our sector, but maybe like a quarter later or a couple of quarters, are we, are we really insulated because of such tailwinds? And so I just think for the day-to-day -day operational decisions, it's a little, it's difficult for people to sort through the, the noise right now. I think that difficulty is going to remain um, through the first half of 23. Yeah, I would just just to echo that you know valuations, you know particularly early stage valuations, um, I, I think are still at crazy levels for the progress that some of the companies have made. I mean, we are seeing companies that are two, three years away from revenues and commercialization of a product um, with valuations that are you know in the thirty to seventy million dollar range, and that just doesn't. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us because it requires ultimately, if they're going to raise follow-on capital, you know, counting on a billion-dollar exit. And if you look historically over a couple decades at the, um, you know, at the way exits have occurred in this space, most of them, you know, center around 200 to 500 million, uh, you know, exit valuation uh, at strategic sales. So. You have to believe, and 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 maybe a lot of people do, that there is going to be, you know, a, a radical paradigm shift in terms of who's acquiring companies, what happens in the public markets, and how they're valuing companies for you to make venture-style returns um, at the valuations folks are paying for early stage. And I think the same thing is happening to some extent in the in the growth capital markets as well. Um, so, you know, I think. The lesson for us, and it's always been this lesson since 2005, that just be extremely valuation disciplined. You might miss miss out on deals. Um, it happens, but there's no shortage of deal flow, and there's no shortage of you know extraordinary entrepreneurs, and there's no shortage of of opportunity. And so, just pick the deals where you're able to add value in ways beyond just um, capital, and um, form you know strong relationships with the entrepreneurs and treat them fairly and and help them grow. Can I, can I tag onto that real quick? Sorry to jump back into, but yeah, that was really, I thought that was really well said, Dan. And one of the things which um, I've just seen, I'm sure it reflects what y'all have seen as well over the past couple of decades, is that, you know, so much of what hurt the last time there was the clean tech crash was the fact that valuations were high and people had set up very capital intensive business models that required carrying a lot of stuff on their balance sheet. But there's an interesting thing that's happening right now that I'm seeing and that so many of these solutions, we're talking about like the physical solution, not the software solutions for a second here. Um, you know, think about like containerized uh, you know, water treatment or, or think about microgrids or anything like that. We're talking about physical assets that are going to be capital intensive when they add up. Um, but what we're seeing that it, it actually does work very well when, you know, CapEx budgets uh, dry up across the corporate community is being able to offer some of those things as a service. Right. So instead of, hey, would you like to spend $10 million on this microgrid? Instead, hey, can I get you to sign a multi year contract for no money down where I'm going to sell you energy services utilizing a microgrid? Right. Somebody still has to pay for that. And that's where a third party capital might be very useful right now rather than try to build it on, you know, raise it and carry a microgrid on your own balance sheet so that you can sell somebody a service contract that you're going to satisfy with the microgrid, if that makes sense. But you know, interestingly to me, there is still a big dichotomy with what I'm seeing in the mainstream infrastructure community, where they have so much dry powder and so much interest right now in this sector, that what I'm seeing is a wave of interest of them actually moving upstream, acquiring portions, if not the outright control of, if not the outright 100% ownership of a developer of microgrids, wastewater treatment, whatever, you know, EV charging networks, 
it, what they think of as a project developer who may think of themselves as an entrepreneur, right? They're interested in acquiring that platform because it has a good pipeline and because they want to then pour a lot of money onto the balance sheet of that and then carry a bunch of these assets on the balance sheet. So it is a time for entrepreneurs in this sector to start to be really agile and facile with utilizing different types of capital because you know this isn't the last clean tech crash where there was basically just two sources of capital, right? There was venture capital, which doesn't know how to deploy stuff. And then it was infrastructure that doesn't know how to deal with relatively new innovations. And so there was a massive gulf in between, but now we have a much more robust capital ecosystem available to help people get through the different phases. It's just really important for entrepreneurs to know what is needed at the different phases and what are the different financing tools at their disposal. Those are uh, great points, Rob and, and Dan. Uh, absolutely, I think uh, the, that's where the opportunity lies for the for the founders. Is that is that sort of innovation and business model, so to speak? You know, um, yet the valuation question is still going to be there in in all of these circumstances. And uh, you know, a friend of mine, an investor, recently said that twenty three is going to be a year of price discovery. I think that's a good way to 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 think about it. I'd like to move us on a little bit. Um, to talk a bit about IRA because or, or IRA, uh, just because that is uh, uh, such a, um, you know, that's the market signal, as Ethan mentioned earlier, that is uh, really will help spur, you know, one of the, some of these tailwinds. Um, and so I'll turn to Ethan and, and maybe Mark uh, for, for this question here, which is, we've all assumed that that uh, was going to be a tremendously positive uh, benefit for the sector. Um, do you see any any negatives to IRA or any any challenges to IRA that that could uh, could have an unintended consequence for our our sector? I mean, I'll try and start. Just which is, I think, a lot of us are waiting for clarity on some of the rules. There's a lot of there was a lot of detail in the legislation, but nowhere near as much detail as is going to eventually exist in the regulations and the implementation of this from the Treasury Department, the IRS, DOE. So I think seeing how that pans out, we'll have to see already, I think on the electric vehicle side, there's some real questions about, I mean, basically the, the electric vehicle tax credit that consumers would get is split into two halves. And one is focused very much on making sure that um, the batteries are stored from the right places in the right ways. Um, and that's gonna be pretty tough, we think, um, for manufacturers to meet. So that's 3750 of the 7,500. Um, so there's a, it creates a good deal of market uncertainty in the in the short run. I I, I guess I would say um, if there are specific parties that like literally are going to get hurt once all the regulations are written, I'm, I'm not. I, I welcome others and see what you know what your what some of your portfolio companies are saying because I would say it's probably a little too early to say that you can know for sure um, the level of generosity of some of the uh, benefits that are offered in the IRA are I mean almost downright outrageous uh, in terms of the level of support that they're providing for technologies like CCUS uh, and hydrogen in particular. Um, but there's also a lot of support, you know, further upstream on manufacturing as well, like I said earlier. So um, I guess I'd say wait and see, but the, the open questions about sort of what's a free trade agreement country, for instance, um, how do you deal with things like what a prevailing wage is in a different part of the uh, country? Um, these are things that are getting sorted um, uh, literally as we speak. Uh, and I would think, you know, it'd be wise for folks to probably wait for some of these questions to get ironed out before they determine whether or not this is the greatest thing since sliced bread or if it's going to hurt them in some major way. Yeah, I'd probably echo a lot of a lot of those comments. I would say it was interesting. It's you know it's massive incentives and um, you know likely huge multiplier effects to it. And you look at the in the public markets, you know it was it didn't really move the needle significantly. Now there's a lot of there's a lot of noise in the public markets, and that sort of muted it. But I think I think most most investors just don't know. It's hard to discern like what how this is going to impact an individual company. To Cassie's point earlier, everyone's sort of talking about it, but no one knows the specifics. I do think that once those rules are written, um, there'll be winners and there may be losers. I, I'll be honest, I don't know. I don't know enough to know who, who would the losers would be, but it's mostly winners. Um, and I think it's the the challenge is going to be timing because I think the the entrepreneurs are going to want to, going to want to capture value for that. And I don't think the investors are gonna give them value until it's until it's absolutely known and that those those um, incentives are starting to flow through the P&L or at least identified how, how it's gonna drive, drive demand. So there's probably a little bit of lag on getting benefit from it, but it's sort of no denying that there's a, it's a massive, massive tailwind. 
Absolutely. Well, that's uh, the, the public sector, you know, putting, you know, a tailwind in. Uh, what are folks seeing by way of maybe private sector activity that could be contributing to uh, tailwinds or to, to optimism for 2023? Uh, I'd like to you know, perhaps get a sense there. I know, for example, Dan, you mentioned uh, we would need to see a paradigm shift to justify some of these valuations we're seeing. Um, is it possible that you know, increased M&A activity or certain industries, you know, like oil and gas moving and shifting to, uh, uh, to a clean, cleaner version of their technologies might be the kinds of catalysts that ultimately you know, allow for a paradigm shift. Yeah, well, since I, I started the game, I'll, I'll try to answer that. I think it's a good question. Um, I think, the amount of leaning in that we're seeing from mining companies, from resources companies, from oil companies is pretty impressive and unprecedented. Um, you know, even kind of cement steel, you know, they're just massive investments coming out of these companies into technology startups, things they've never done before. Um, so I think that's really great to see, but that's not, that's a far cry from them, you know, acquiring an early or, or an early stage company or a company that has commercialized technology. And I, I think those companies are generally extremely disciplined about valuation. Um, and they're also very careful, you know, that it's accretive and it's generally has positive net income because they're just not used to managing tiny little companies within, you know, uh, multi tens of billions of dollars of, um, of capitalization. So I think a lot of the companies we're seeing in this space need to make significant progress to get to a point where they're ready for acquisition. And, I, and that, that's going to take a number of years and it's going to take a lot of capital to deploy projects, whether you're talking about low carbon cement, talking about recovery of minerals from recycling facilities and mines uh, and mine tailings. You know, or or things like the hydrogen opportunity within you know uh, uh, thirty or forty electrolyzer startups that have uh, raised capital. So, you know, there there are, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of money that needs to be plowed into the space, which will come from public and private to get the companies to the point where maybe they're viable for acquisition. But I just don't see you know folks sort of overpaying for yeah. uh, technology companies. Can I, yeah. can I? Oh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. Go ahead, Mark. I was, yeah, I was gonna say on, on M and A. Um, you know, obviously M and A is a big part of M and A is is business fundamentals, financials, strategic objectives, and the like. But you can't discount psychology, and and M and A is driven by fear and greed. And in 2023, it's it's unfortunately, I think you're gonna see a lot more fear than than greed. I think you're, you're certainly gonna see M and A deals get done, but it is really hard to buy uh, to take big risks on 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 new technology pay big multiples when you're in a in a recession and when your board boards of directors you know worried about um you know worried about cash flows and and investor sentiment and the like so you know in, in my mind the the you know we're probably in a transition year next year in terms of valuation i think a lot of what we're seeing is a lot of companies you know are still um holding on to 2021 valuations uh, investors and buyers are are uh, seeing what's happened in the public markets. They're seeing the comps. They're worried about next year's cash flow. And until there's sort of the capitulation and and they they're both on the same page, uh, it's going to be hard to get those those good high multiple deals done. But again, these the secular tailwinds are there. He keep on using that phrase, but they're there. It's just you have to it just needs to be patience on on when the on the when the market turns. Because the the value that's to be created in the sector is is tremendous, but but likely not next year in terms of exits. Can I just uh, add uh, one or two quick things? And, and by the way, going all the way back to Rob's um, suggestion, which is um, if you see money, you should take it, which has definitely been words I've lived by or tried to um, or, or over the course of my life, and I think is always good advice. Um, but I'm probably a little more, and and, and with the confession, I'm not a, a macroeconomics expert here, but I'm a little less. Um, Maybe worried overall um, about the, the state of things. I think that uh, I, mean, I think consumer balance sheets are pretty decent, and I think um, I mean I, I sit here in Washington, so maybe I over-index this, but everybody said that the economy was so terrible, and voters were going to be so angry 
an ang- they weren't that ang- they didn't turn out to be that angry. They effectively mostly reelected everybody, which we might suggest that they're not hurting from the economy and maybe the economy is a little stronger than we give it um, some credit for. Um, but the other thing coming back on the, the sort of corporate sort of um, you know um, tailwinds. Uh, the the number of promises, of course, that we're seeing every year around companies achieving some kind of net zero or 24-7 clean energy in the case of Google or some of these others, the numbers keep rising. Um, there is clearly a bit of a backlash on the ESG finance side, which we're seeing out of places like Florida and Georgia, uh, Florida and, and Texas and others against BlackRock and others. So there's a little bit of that. Um, but I'll, I'll throw one other thing into the mix, which I feel like uh, is kind of a wild card that I feel like we've been waiting on for a long time, um, which is what's the point at which the, the U.S. oil majors really finally um, jump into this space in a, in a really serious way. I mean, they've certainly been running advertising advertisements for years, boasting about this or that biofuel investment or whatever they did, but it's nothing compared to the kind of involvement that we've seen from the European oil majors in the forms of Shell and BP, um, not to mention some of the others in Europe as well. And um, if they get serious, uh, about this space and the kind of resources they have that could provide a real serious tailwind um, overall. So, you know, fingers crossed that maybe that'll start to happen in a bigger way uh, in 2023. Yeah, we've certainly have seen um, you know, the Europeans, uh, you know, I think of one of my, my favorite stories, you know, the Danish oil and natural gas company is now worsted the greatest and largest renewable energy company on earth, right? So it, it can happen and, and likely will happen with greater pace eventually. Uh, I want to uh, get a question off to Cassie um, and then and then others as they may want to uh, fill in. Uh, in this last year, one of my observations was that you know many of our, our clients were constrained by virtue of not being able to hire the people they needed in order to execute on their business models. That same crunch of of, of labor and of, uh, of the technical skilled people who didn't exist. We're now starting to see layoffs in particularly in the tech sector. Um, is there an opportunity there to kind of uh, repurpose or try to snag some of those uh, right smart resources and, and pull them into this sector what do you think and how do you how do you, how do you guys think about that as a, as a as an investment fund uh definitely and i think we've been waiting for this moment from a talent perspective for the past kind of at least 10 years to okay we have all these tech people who are very capable with transferable skills when are we going to see people moving over i mean i'm sure everyone on the call now is fielding a lot more uh even just personal inquiries from folks in the tech sector asking hey i want to get into climate now's the time um and it's very real it's not just you know people casually exploring it so I think that's super exciting. I have always felt like there's a talent arbitrage opportunity within our space um, versus other sectors. And so we are seeing that. Um, but it is interesting to my previous point about now, like these two mixed signals. Is every company went from really struggling, struggling to hire people to just so excited because their pipelines of hiring started looking better to now like, Okay, now we can hire whoever we want, but how many people should we be hiring and at what rate and what should we be paying them because their salary expectations are still quite elevated. And so we need to sort through those questions a little bit, but the talent level is really impressive. Great. Anyone else want to field that one? Give some perspectives. I mean, I haven't had a lot of crypto bros coming yet to try and get jobs <laughs> with me yet, but um, I, I suspect we'll get some more crypto inbound in the next couple of months. And, and, I mean, in joking aside, I, I, I'll just say one thing, which is in terms of the type of people that I know we like to look for is we, we generally want people who are uh, extremely practical, but we also want people who are, who are idealistic and want to um, change the world for the better. And I, uh, I'll, I'll just try and be polite and just saying that I'm not sure that everybody who's going to come out of those other sectors is going to fit that that mode necessarily. Great. Uh, we've got about uh, eight minutes left. Uh, so we're, I think, we're moving along. We actually were able to get started on time, actually not seven minutes. But um, I'm going to ask one or two more questions as we close out uh, this part of the, the day. Um, Earlier in the discussion, Cassie, you had mentioned that um, you know we were seeing other industries you know slow you know uh, you know down a bit, tech you know valuations decrease a bit. You know, we certainly have seen the venture capital community and other sectors really you know, decide to take a wait and see approach and maybe see whether they can get more uh, value uh, out of their money. Um, and same same holds for growth equity as well. Um, so if you're a founder, uh, you know at a, at a, at a clean tech company. 
um, you know, and you're about to embark on a fundraising round, uh, now may not be the time to do that. But um, let's say you got to do it. Um, you know, what are some of the things that they should look out for? You know, when they're when they are fundraising. Yeah, I think so. the The 2020-21 playbook doesn't work. The 2020-21 playbook was don't go out until you're exactly ready. Start a process when you're exactly ready. Run a tight process. Build competitive tension. You know, you, it was okay to set some some pretty lofty valuation expectations, and then that usually resulted in a successful process. Um, and that just doesn't work anymore. And so I think we're advising folks to um, go out ahead of time more than you think. So previously we would have said six months is the absolute latest. I would say six months is until cash out is still the absolute, absolute latest really should be doing it a year ahead of time. Um, and then to just have a more collaborative conversation with your investors, you know, go out with potentially a range of round sizes to that you could, you know, one where you would have a more of a growth plan, one that is maybe more conservative, um, and then really let the market decide on valuation because um, I think going out too strong on those points can can um, backfire in this environment. Um, and then also being flexible on what the syndicate looks like. To the point on strategics, strategics, I think, are playing an even more important role in uh, capital raising right now. And some oh, rounds sure. are coming together with, you know, be a little more flexible on what the lead looks like, participation with insiders, participation with strategics. So I think flexibility is the name of the game. Uh, Mark, I, would, uh, I know I'm you, sorry. Oh, uh, Rob, go ahead and then we'll turn to Mark. Yeah. I was just inspired by what Cassie was saying, so I couldn't help myself. Um, no, in, in general, in addition to that too, uh, uh, go out there saying your money will go a long way. I mean, and whether that's because, hey, look, we, we know exactly, you know, concretely what our runway is with this money. Uh, but also like, here's the other capital we can leverage, right? Here's grants we can leverage. Here's this we can leverage. So, it, you know, I think the scary thing to hit up a, a new investor with right now is something like, hey, we need you to really carry us forward by yourself. And instead, if you can say, hey, if you give us what we need here in terms of a little bit of kindling, we can make a bonfire out of it. Yeah, I'd echo all those things. I, I'd, I'd also go back to some of the things that Rob was saying earlier. I do think you, you know, companies should be creative and look at those non-dilutive sources. I mean, to his point, there are um, certainly benefits to be able to offer products as a service and finding a a, a financing source who who may um, either an infrastructure fund or, or or obviously funds like like Rob's where where they can fund that uh, creatively and and um, and and enable sort of the the sale of products through financing, uh, but offer those to customers um, on, a, on an annual basis and not as an upfront upfront payment. There's, I think there's a lot of money in, in the system for that, for those types of opportunities. And I, and I suspect a lot of uh, founders don't think of it in those terms, um, but I think in, in, you know, that, they, that they should because there's multiple benefits to it. And Rob can and give me, give me $10 well. uh, for, for that uh, later. <laughs> yeah, no, I think everything that was said was really, really um, insightful. Um, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is there are so many new investors in this space and uh, not everyone comes with the same strategy, whether it's early stage, you know, pre-growth, growth, whatever. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example like, we just raised a pretty significant round for Line Vision, led by Climate Innovation Capital. I had never heard of Climate Innovation Capital before they led Line Vision's raise. Fantastic Canadian firm, lots of experience in the sector, really great support for the company. Um, and you know, there's there's you know, 20, 30, 50, 50 of those kinds of venture investors in the market now because so much capital has moved into this area. So I think we're fortunate to have more diversity of investors and investors' objectives and criteria for investing. Um, I think it's good for the ecosystem. And, and obviously, as Rob said, we have an end-to-end -end ecosystem now from philanthropic capital all the way through to you know, project and growth capital and, and buyout and, and, and the like. So um, this is a, a maturing space. And I think that's an incredibly healthy thing for companies that deserve to raise capital to be able to do so. That's a great point, Dan. There's been a, you know, a, it used to be you knew everyone in the ecosystem and, and now um, it's just 
you know, you can't keep track, you know, and uh, that ultimately is, you know, hopefully will under the benefit uh, to innovation and in greater scale. Um, one quick, one last question before we hit sort of the Q and A timeframe. I'm going to ask this one to Ethan. Um, so uh, you guys, again, you guys do have that macro view. You do a lot of work at Bloomberg and, and drill into a lot of data. And so um, when you look at trends, like we're going into 2023, we talked about headwinds and tailwinds. Well, what would you predict us to wind up? Where do you think we'll be at the end of 23? Or what might be some of the changes that you see occur between the year, beginning of the year and the end of the year? Uh, well, good question. Tough question. But I, I mean, I, I think I, I don't think this year and probably not next year, we're go, are we going to see the kind of money that was raised over the public markets, um, in part because the SPAC phenomenon, I think, was a kind of a maybe a once in a lifetime thing. Um, and it really raised so much money. And also because arguably a lot of companies, there were so many companies that raised growth capital last year. Maybe there's a few less around at the moment than there were then as a result of that. So. I don't think we're going to see the same kind of public market activity this year or next year that we saw in 2021 um, sort of overall. Um, but uh, the amount of money that's been raised on the venture side is pretty extraordinary. And, um, you know, as Dan was mentioning, it, it, it you know, the, the VC community in, in clean, clean energy used to fit at a pretty small conference like in Palm Springs or, you know, Silicon Valley. And that was kind of it. But I since I haven't been in a while, but I sense there's a lot more people doing this and a lot of new people that are involved in this. So I think there's a lot of there's still a lot of capital available that's out there. And people are probably being a bit cautious in some cases, given what you're saying, Dan, about valuations. Um, but we'll have to see. I mean, I think the other thing is, um, I mean, this is obviously this is totally staying the obvious when you're talking about, you know, startup companies and and and, um, you know, and, and innovation. But folks have to hit their milestones and like do what they say they're going to do. And I totally agree with Rob that, you know, the last time this all shook out, a big part of it was because, you know, companies got to the end of the road on their venture funding and then they couldn't raise the billion or whatever they needed to build the demonstration scale project. But then there were a bunch of companies that also just didn't do what they said they were going to do um, and disappeared. And then there were some companies that were trying to do solar and, you know, innovate around the idea that like silicon prices were going to be expensive forever. And then they weren't all of a sudden and a whole slew of companies got wiped out there. So there, so there's definitely some people who are going to make the world calls. Um, and so, you know, I think that's just kind of inevitable in, in all of this as well. Nobody on this panel, though. Everybody on this panel is going to make all the right calls. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. That's where we have the all-stars. Um, well, at this point, I think I'll turn it over uh, to, to Trish and the NECC team. I think we're going to try to pull some Q&A out, out of the question uh, box here. Perfect. Go ahead, Tricia. <laughs> Just going to introduce you, Carly, so go, on, go for it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Tricia. Thanks, Tom. Great panel. I have some Q&A that we've gotten from the audience, both prior to even being here today. So we'll kick off with one of those from Reed McManigle at Carnegie Mellon. His question is, are there any examples that you've seen of regional counterparts to programs like the DOE's Lab Embedded Entrepreneurship Fellowships or Breakthrough Energy Ventures, specifically programs at the local or regional level um, that can help retain PhD students and postdocs um, while they work to de-risk the deep tech that's common within the clean tech space? So maybe like Cyclotron, I know, has been out there. Um, trying to do exactly that, right? Um, that's an effort out on the West Coast that has essentially been uh, giving PhDs the, the, the resources they need to be able to uh, stay in the fight, essentially, um, with the hope of turning those innovations into uh, commercialized, um, commercialized reality. Um, I don't know, it, I don't do early stage investing very much anymore, so I'll, I'll, I'll defer to my, uh, to my colleagues on the panel. Would uh, would something like Activate, or are they just more of like an incubator? I mean, I think Activate is the the you know the new cyclotron road, effectively, um, and I, I think they do exactly like Rob, Rob said, which is you know to support companies either in university or mostly like entrepreneurs who want to spin out of a university lab or something. And um, there's some really interesting companies in in Boston um, doing that. And um, but they have they have sites in a number of places, and they have kind of an anywhere um, uh, program as well. But uh, I would say we need more of it. Uh, honestly, I I think there is a lack of support 
Um, and, and, and when you think about the international environment, you know, and I, I think about what happened at COP and, and the need to address emerging markets and how do we get new technologies, not only commercialized in those emerging markets, but get manufacturing and technologies from Europe and the US moved to emerging markets for manufacturing and, and deployment. We need more uh, technology development across the world, not just in Boston and Silicon Valley and, and Milwaukee and, 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 and Houston. We need, you know, we need, we need to seed a lot of uh, new um, incubators and entrepreneurs in lots of different places. There are smart people everywhere in the world and we need to get them involved in fighting uh, climate change. So I think that's one of the, the a critical need um, beyond just uh, this country, which has, has a lot of capital flowing in. I'll, I'd like to take that question and pivot on it a little bit though. I wholehearted agreement with, with what Dan said. We need more innovation across the board. Um, you know, we don't have the complete solution set that we're gonna need to, you know, fully tackle climate change, for instance. Um, but we do have a lot of the solution set and, and a lot of folks maybe even, you know, watching this webinar today, uh, consider themselves entrepreneurs who are sort of past the technological ideation stage and, and into commercialization. Um, one of the things which we've been surprised to find at our shop is how few places are available for entrepreneurs to learn the art of project development. And if you want your idea to scale and have actual impact, it needs to get deployed at scale. And what that means is you need to either find somebody else who's going to be your project developer and take your idea and run with it. And spoiler alert, they generally don't exist until you're on your 12th version of it, right? Then if you've got 12 of them out there in the world, then there's plenty of infrastructure dollars ready for you. But to get to that point, you need to probably at least know how to talk with project developers in their own language. And one of the things which I would love to see, and we were very pleased to partner with the NECEC uh, on one of our own recent developer university um, events that we pulled together um, to, to really take two days and get deep into what does project development look like? What is the jargon? What do you need to think about? to be able to attract you know successfully infrastructure capital when you're ready for it uh we purposely partnered with necec um, on, on that event that was here in boston last month because we're really hoping that the nececs of the world and, and other groups um can start to incorporate more training of project development skill sets alongside entrepreneurship uh, skill sets because like i said at the beginning of this i really feel like 2023 and beyond has got to be the deployment era now but that means everybody's got to learn how to be a project developer or at least speak with them credibly. I can bring up our next question, which came from Martin Bernstein at LBBW. His question is, are environmental commodities such as compliance or voluntary carbon markets, renewable energy credits, et cetera, playing a material role in opportunities that people are pursuing? I've been I mean, jumping in a lot. Yeah, I don't I'll want say, to I'll keep say, jumping yeah, in. I can say yes, Rob, and then hand it to you. No, <laughs> I mean, I think there's there's definitely, you know, folks, companies are making, have made these net zero pledges and then they really have no idea how they're going to achieve them. And the only, and at the moment, um, you know, going out and buying some sort of questionably credible uh, offsets um, is the is the only real route for some of them to do it. And um, so, which of course screams out the need to make sure that that there is credibility in those markets um, or, or also greater visibility around exactly how you are reducing um, CO2. Um, I think it's interesting if we watch, uh, just to take one example, um, if we keep an eye on what happens with, with um, carbon capture uh, utilization and storage projects in the US that are gonna try and get built, you know, could they find offtake, you know, could they sell credits or some kind of have offtake agreements with big tech companies that have pledged to go zero carbon and don't want to buy, again, questionable uh, offsets from, from you know, the, the rainforest or wherever. Um, I think those are some real opportunities that we're going to potentially see and IRA may, may, um, may, may supercharge that a bit. I, I think I'd add to that, that, you know, we're actually also seeing companies that are uh, attempting to, um, 
know, clean up, verify, you know, make those carbon credits and offsets uh, verifiable and um, not questionable any longer. And there's a substantial amount of uh, entrepreneurial activity there, and there appears to be some investors willing to uh, be a part of that as well. So uh, uh, that's a, a good good sign for that marketplace. Yeah, I think it's an important tool. It's going to continue to be one, but I think we'll hopefully see it uh, move from being a very blunt tool uh, to a lot more nuanced solutions, depending on your needs. What 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 we've seen is that you know there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are starting to think a lot about how they can create additional revenue streams for themselves through provisioning um, these you know environmental commodities in addition to whatever was their sort of core business, right? So think about like you know biochar, right? Um, biochar production uh, to sell the biochar as an agricultural uh, soil you know additive. Um, but by the way, now we can also generate these these carbon credits and sell them. The, the, the caution is uh, you either need to be prepared for a multi-year process of getting your particular flavor of credits accredited um, before you can really sell them, uh, or you need to be aiming at established categories. So for instance, uh, anybody who's um, you know, producing you know, natural gas as a byproduct of whatever they're doing, uh, so think wastewater treatment, there, there are existing markets for LCFS for, for RNG just in general. Um, that people can tap into pretty readily. But then we also see folks who have an innovative new process um, that's you know, doing some kind of carbon uh, sequestration along the way, uh, or otherwise they can claim it creates carbon benefits and they get excited about what they could you know, create for themselves and that value. And the methodology just simply doesn't exist yet. It can be done, but you need to hire consultants. You need to spend, like I said, a couple of years. You need to work through the, the certifying authorities. Anybody who's attempted to shortcut that has had it blow up in their face. So just be wary about that. If there's an existing easy pathway to selling what you can sell, whether that's RINs, uh, whether that's you know uh, carbon credits, what have you, um, then yes, absolutely. Those are now being supercharged and you can layer that on. But if it's not an existing established category, uh, it's gonna take a while. Wonderful. Our next question comes from Jane Abaji. Um, her question is, given some earlier comments about going after available money now, are there some sources that may not be appropriate to pursue um, when you're when you're looking for funding? Yeah, I, I can I can make one comment about this, which is, um, you know, I think folks should be really careful about debt capital markets now. Um, you know, and, and think very carefully about their capitalization before, um, you know, I mean, at, at any time, I think you should be careful about leverage. But in this particular time with interest rates rising um, and, and credit tightening, um, I think, you know, terms are not going to be as good as they were six, 12 months ago, even. Um, we saw some really just extraordinary venture debt deals, um, you know, the last couple of years. And that market is really starting to to change a little bit. Um, you know, obviously a flight to quality, I think. So that would be one area where I would be really cautious and think carefully about what am I going to be paying for this? How am I going to pay it back? Do I need to raise more equity capital to be able to pay it back? Because you know that that may be a little bit of a of a challenge in the current market situation. And um, yeah, just be a little bit more cautious. This may go. Say, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I keep jumping in because I see uh, pregnant pauses, but that doesn't mean I need to hold the mic. <laughs> yeah, this this may uh, go without saying, but I, I'd be wary of spacs. I mean, I think that that market is 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 now incredibly challenged, um, and you still have spacs looking to do to do deals. But I'd be I'd be very concerned that you get any capital out of it. Um, in terms of uh, strategic investment, we are hugely we are generally big fans of strategic investment but the devil's in the details so if you're if you're if you're um you know talking to big strategics about having them put in capital i would just make sure that uh it, it won't impact your exit uh eventually obviously capital uh, you know cash is king capital is critical but um but you got to make sure you're protected on the backside. I will, I will lob in what I was going to say as well. That's smart uh, about strategics and the double-edged sword. Um, 
The other thing which I think is especially important, it's always important, but it's especially important when you're going into a period like we're about to, is to make sure that you're on the same page with whatever investor you're talking to about risk appetite. Uh, and that works both ways. You know, if you want to run quick, but the investor you're talking to wants you to run slow, you're just going to be at loggerheads. And it's even worse if it's vice versa. Um, you know, if you have a set path that you want to pursue and the investor that you're talking to says, oh, but what you really need to do is, is spend twice the amount of money that you're counting on so you can run twice as fast. Um, don't worry about it. You know, this is what everybody does. I mean, if that doesn't match your expectation, um, then you're also going to have real issues. And especially if it's a relatively unsophisticated investor who's saying that. I was recently in a room full of multiple investors. Um, and we were discussing a couple of concrete opportunities. And it was just amazing the diversity uh, of approaches amongst these, these are mostly early stage investors around the table. Some of them were saying, great, I love hearing that this entrepreneur who's developing this innovation that won't be commercialized for a few years out is trying to stay very lean and, and get themselves down the road with just a few million dollars to the point of commercialization. And then you know they'll, they'll try to accelerate. And then there was an analogous one we were talking uh, to that, that instead wanted to raise, you know, like upwards of like $20 million um, to, to build out their own fab and do their own thing and do everything themselves. Um, and, and, you know, some of the investors were horrified and some of the investors were like, yes, absolutely. I love hearing that. Let's go. Right. So, you know, it, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm not trying to preach one particular approach, but it is really important to make sure that you're on the same page with your investor in terms of what is your risk appetite and your plan. Our next question comes from Peter Rothstein. His question is, the IRA includes funding for green banks. Can those funds also support training on project development? I guess I'll jump in here and say, I think probably, but I think that the money that's allocated, that we, based, based on our read on it, we're, we're waiting for a lot more details on how that money is gonna get um, allocated. The, the, the legislation, um, was particularly non-specific about it. Um, it does set aside, if I recall, a lot of money though that's supposed to go through states. And then I think there's a lot of discretion from that point thereafter. So uh, I, the short answer is uh, not no, uh, and probably yes, um, but, but stay tuned because there's a lot more details I think that needs to come. Um, I think it's from the EPA that has to write them uh, around that. We have another question from Martin Bernstein. He asks, any interesting strategies on bridging the gap between the need for capital and what we often hear from investors about the lack of bankable opportunities? Any thoughts there? Uh, go to Rob Day. I nominate Rob. <laughs> that would be the, <laughs> the, uh, the person, right? So, so sorry, I missed the question. I was reading one of the questions in the in the chat. What was the question? Oh, sorry, I can repeat. Uh, the question is, are there any interesting strategies on bridging the gap between the need for capital <laughs> and what yeah. we often hear from investors about the lack of bankable opportunities? Now, I knew that one was gonna come to me and yet it happened to come right when I was reading another interesting question in the chat, so my apologies. I was planning on being silent on this question since I keep monopolizing the conversation. No, this um, was geared to you. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, yes, so interesting strategies. Uh, you, you first of all need to be really thinking about um, you know, uh, how you're gonna get your first few out there. Uh, it really depends upon the scale that you're talking about. One of the things that I think we haven't, and it's a longer topic, but but coming out of the IRA is is, is, is there's going to be a lot more encouragement for smaller types of projects, um, thanks to hopefully the way the transferability of credits, um, you know, gets gets promulgated. I think that's by Treasury actually. Um, but in, in any case, if you have smaller scale projects, your best opportunity is to actually just go out there and do a couple. Um, I know I was talking about like trying to keep stuff off balance sheet, but if you can just get a couple of them done, then you can go out there and show the, the world that you are bankable, right? Um, if, uh, on the other hand, uh, you're talking about a much bigger, um, you know, think about like a biofuel refinery, like, uh, you know, something like that, um, you know, that's where you need to turn to uh, JV partners or to non-dilutive, you know, grant makers, essentially, uh, even though it's not always structured like a grant. So think about like Breakthrough Energy Catalyst, the new project finance prove out arm 
uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, if you happen to be in one of the categories that they're specifically targeting, um, or find a large strategic player who's interested in a JV with you to build out that first commercial scale plant. Um, in terms of you know, what else you can do to prove your bankability, there are some emerging insurance instruments. Um, it just really depends category by category, but you know, groups like Energetic Insurance and others are out there um, trying to figure out how to give some backstop uh, to help make sure that there are performance guarantees or otherwise that, that people can count on it. Um, and then you know, what we've also seen is that you can utilize different slices of capital for different purposes. So if you're trying to, for instance, build out fleets of electric vehicle chargers, well, some of that can be rebates and then you can get rebate financing essentially to, to support some of that and give yourself the capital. But in the meantime, you're also gonna to need to go out there um, and raise you know, some additional deployment capital. It's just that since it's a lot less and you can therefore say some project finance version of what I said before, like, hey, your little bit of money goes a long way, um, that's still saleable. Anything like that is, is helpful for convincing project finance. But that's a, I mean, honestly, we just spent like two full days with a room full of more than a couple uh, of dozen entrepreneurs in Boston going through uh, exactly this question in detail. So it's a great question, but I could barely scratch the surface, sorry. That, that's a very thorough answer. I'll give a much less thorough one, which is uh, two other quick things, which is the loan program office of the Department of Energy is most certainly open for business at the moment. Um, and the uh, IRA probably basically gave them more money than they'll be able to spend, I think, before the um, before their uh, authorization comes up at some point. And um, so for them, I think the limiting factor is just going to be the number of people they have to review and to process the loan applications that they that they get. So that's that's definitely an option. And then to take the question in a, a bit different direction, the other area that you know, we, uh, at least my group at BNF, thinks a lot about is in the context of, of, of emerging markets and developing economies, there's always this, this, this broader discussion around, um, you, know, oh, you know, is there capital available or isn't there capital available to fund clean energy projects in um, developing countries? And the, the, the short answer is I, we tend to think there is money available, but the, the challenge is that, that um, there is uh, often not the kind of regulatory regimes and sort of certainty about off takers and state run utilities and things like that, um, that have allowed enough money to move in that area. And there are a number of various sort of innovations and efforts around that from the World Bank and others, none of which have really worked all that well, um, to be honest with you so far, um, but, um, but that's definitely an ongoing challenge. I just wanted to add, um, when companies are balance sheeting, which which we see most of the time in, in the beginning, I think it is important to continually test the market to see if it if it may be the time to move off balance sheet, because in the meantime of project deployment, underwriters criteria could have changed and people are starting to take more risk. There are a lot more groups out there um, who are having creative approaches. And so, um, you know, while the answer might be one thing a year later, it might be another. And so just making sure to be on top of opportunities to move off balance sheet. That's a great point. And another question from the chat from Emily Thiessen of Diagram Ventures. Why do you think the circular economy will be such a big trend in 2023? Is there a certain timing element behind this? Well, I mean, we, we've we made a number of investments in the space. And I think um, the, the easy answer to that is that there is funding um, in the IRA specifically for, uh, you know, helping the circular economy develop. So as was mentioned earlier, half of the incentive for EVs uh, goes to sourcing. And I think uh, that's not only meant to onshore, um, you know, battery manufacturing, but also to source things like nickel, cobalt, copper, and other materials um, within our borders and uh, within our you know, certain other countries that are, I guess, viewed as, as our partners. So, you know, there's a huge incentive to set up new technologies that can cost effectively um, recycle material, these kinds of, of critical minerals from end of life batteries, uh, catalytic converters, to the extent they're not stolen. Um, and, uh, um, you know, a lot of uh, e-waste and, and many other materials that are in the industrial ecosystem, recover those metals efficiently, like our company Uncycle does this, and, uh, and, and process them into the supply chain 
for cathode manufacturing uh, and, and, and other parts of the battery. So we think that's a one driver of this, but I think there's just also renewed attention on technologies that can be cost effective for producing um, you know, things like polymers in a more effective way, using waste products um, and um, you know, things like robotics to segregate uh, waste streams more effectively and more cost effectively. So I, I just think there's a lot of it more attention, a lot more capital flowing into the sector. And um, uh, I think it's been recognized that if you can find cost-effective technologies, there's plenty of feedstock that you can monetize with that. One other thing in addition to that, which is uh, spot on, um, there's a macro issue that uh, actually uh, encourages the circular economy. If you think about the, the circular economy as really being about localizing as well, Right, because in order for the circular economy to, to work, in many cases, you're talking about taking localized but uh, fragmented waste streams, um, figuring out how to turn them into somebody else's source of supply or input, uh, again, on a localized basis. Um, I think over the past couple of years, we've all now seen plenty of evidence that global supply chains are fragile and vulnerable. And I think a lot of business owners are now seeing that as well. And so a lot of what I'm seeing encouraging the use of what I would call circular economy, which is, you know, waste to on-site reuse, um, wastewater recycling to, to water as an input, things like that um, are being driven as much as anything else by um, companies that are looking to just, you know, take back some control over their own supply chain by essentially doing things on-site where they can, uh, or at least on a local basis. Um, and if you think about that, the other thing that's encouraging it, particularly in 2023, in my mind, is that you're talking about smaller scale projects then, right? If you're talking about a localized solution, you're not talking about a, a big hub and spoke, um, you know, distribution around a utility scale solution. You're talking about something smaller that's on site with um, very often a corporate customer. Well, depending upon how, how the credit transferability rules get promulgated by treasury coming out of the IRA, then what you're gonna find is it's a lot easier for the vendor of that circular economy um, solution to be able to make the economics even more compelling for their corporate customer. Um, hey, fine, you sign this 10 year service contract, we're gonna treat your waste and sell you this input. Um, but not only are you gonna save money that you thought you were gonna save money out of this, we're also additionally gonna be able to reap these economic benefits from these tax credits and now we can just share them with you. Right, so you can afford to pay us more. We give you the tax credits because you, the corporate customer, ostensibly are profitable. Um, and, and now, you know, this all just goes straight to both of our bottom lines. That's going to itself enable a lot more selling of these kind of circular economy solutions. Great. Well, I think we're probably out of time on questions. And so we're going to begin to uh, wrap up here. We have the last four minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll give a couple of comments and then we'll turn it back over to our friends at NECC. First off, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for a really insightful discussion today. Uh, this is, uh, as I expected, one of the more insightful ones we've had, you know, honest, uh, important information for all of our audience to learn. Um, you know, I thought I might do a wrap up, but, you know, there was a lot covered here, so I'm not sure that you can put it all into a bow. But, you know, I think when we look out to 23, um, it's going to be a year of headwinds and a year of tailwinds. And, and uh, we don't know who's going to or how that's going to play out or how it's going to win out. And, and that's going to make for, a, you know, quite a uh, quite a challenging year for everybody, you know, for you know, difficult investment decisions uh, for for founders in terms of. Um, you know, seeking capital. Um, you know, we know that the IRA is is going to be one of the the heaviest tailwinds. We just don't know how much clarity we'll get out of it over the course of the next year. So, you know, while we had enormous amounts of capital spent in twenty one and twenty, um, you know, this year was certainly less. Um, and you know, probably expect those public markets to likely remain um, you know, a bit more uh, uh, a bit tighter than than they have been. And so, uh, it'll it'll really come down to private capital investment. I think to to keep this uh, this sector moving along. Um, well, with that, I will uh, turn it back over to our friends at NECC. Thank you, Tom. And uh, real special special recognition to Tom, uh, Tom Burton and Mintz uh, for this collaboration with the webinar and keeping the discussion focused and informative and all the while extremely interesting. I know I was furiously writing notes and, and takeaways from all of the points that were brought up 
from today's panelists. So thank you again to Cassie Bow, Rob Day, Dan Goldman, Mark Marano, and Ethan Zindler for your contributions on this panel and for such a healthy, robust, um, and intriguing conversation that leaves a lot more and begs, begs even greater questions. But I think what um, the most important takeaway that I personally have, and I hope you all share the sentiment with me is that it's important to continue this conversation, to stay curious and to be asking these questions, seeking the answers and, and really identifying the action and the resources, as well as the partnerships and the relationships that will capitalize on these market opportunities, um, as well as to, to help to carve out the future for an equitable and, and just um, and stable climate economy. So thank you to each and every one of you who attended today and for those of you who asked questions from our panelists. As a reminder, we did record today's webinar. So that recording along with a brief recap of um, today's discussion will be circulated to all registered attendees. So if you did um, happen to miss any portion of the webinar, you can reference it in the recording as well as any other resources that came along with today's conversation. So thank you all so much for, for joining us. And thank you again to our panelists, to Mintz and to Tom for, for helping to lead us lead us here. So we will conclude here and look forward to staying connected. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful afternoon. I think we can end the recording now.